Chris Godinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon Arizona Mountain Standard Time, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, and of course that's all going to change when the time changes. Arizona doesn't time change time, but, you know, everybody else does around us, and then it gets really confusing, so... We'll cross that bridge when we get there. All right, this video is for educational and informational purposes only. In the views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka done. I am proud to be sponsored by BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P, with a P, that's a P, betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas. I will put it down in the... Um, description so that you can get to it. BetterHelp is an online uh, counseling service, so they connect you with uh, licensed professional counselors in your state. Everyone is master's level or PhD level. Um, if you are in the United States and you're in a rural town and you don't like the idea of seeing the therapist in your small little town, you want to be a little more anonymous, even though HIPAA laws, hello. But um, <clears throat> they will connect you with somebody that is licensed in your state, probably in a different city or a different area, and you can see them online. If you are outside of the United States and you are in a country where you are having a waiting list and you are desperate to get into a good counselor, they will connect you with somebody here in the U.S. and then you can do your counseling that way, telehealth, obviously. So uh, there that is. Okay. Can't think of anything else? All right. Let's jump into it. So there's a whole bunch of questions today and I don't have a great deal of time. So... All right, can we, <clears throat> first question, can we gray rock apologize? Like, sorry, I'm not doing enough for you and go for a nice long walk. Well, here's the thing. We can, you can, but it's disingenuous, you know, because generally it's kind of like, well, if you're gray rocking, you know, are you feeding the bear? Are they trying to make you apologize for something you didn't do? You shouldn't be apologizing for something you didn't do. Even Gray Rock apologizing. That's not a good idea. If somebody's going, well, you need to apologize. You need to apologize. Y'all need to draw the boundary and be like, uh, no, I don't. Oh, really? Uh, funny. You're twisting this and you did this. Not playing. Right? And then you get away from them. Because calling them out on their stuff is never going to work. Playing their game is never going to work. It just doesn't. If you're having to gray rock somebody and apologize to them, get the hell out. Save yourself. So I hope that answers that question. Um, I have an elderly narcissistic neighbor. She always wants me to take her garbage out and she wants to talk. How do I respond? How do I draw boundaries? Disease to please Harriet Breaker. Codependent no more. Beyond codependent no more. Both by Melanie Beattie. No. No is a complete and whole sentence. No, I don't have time to talk. Sorry. You know, and you just start walking away. Even though she's still talking, you just start walking away. You are under no obligation to have a conversation with literally anyone. So, you know, no is a complete and total sentence. No is a complete and total answer. And if they don't respect it, you just, I'm sorry, gotta go, you know, or, up, oh, gotta go. You know, don't even apologize. Just, up, oh, gotta go. And then you hightail it back home. So yeah, they do tend to try to monopolize your time, especially older narcissists who are collapsed. Nobody's paying attention to them. They're not good looking. They don't have the money. They don't have the power. And so they start talking people's ears off, which like a vault. So you just say no and you just walk away and you stick to it and you stop feeling guilty. So any relationship that makes you feel fearful, obligated, or guilty, otherwise known as the fog, you know that you need to walk away. It's like, oh, yeah, hey, Myrtle. Hey, here's your garbage. Okay, I don't have time to talk tonight. I'll talk to you later. And then you go. And you do that each and every time. Because if you don't, they're just going to, you're going to be standing there, you know, until 2 o'clock in the morning listening to this person jabber. So, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, when you've been scapegoated by your family, why can other people tell and then try to make you the scapegoat Two, it's almost like I have a sign on my forehead that says, please scapegoat me. Well, we do. So when we've been scapegoat, scapegoated, we are trained and taught to act like literally everything on the face of the planet is our fault. One of my dad's favorite way to stop calling me spam numbers, thank you very much, 
One of my dad's favorite ways to guilt trip everybody at mealtime was, you know, oh, you should feel guilty because there are starving children in China and starving children in India and you didn't finish everything on your plate, so you should feel guilty. So that was a great way to manipulate and control and make mealtimes miserable. So scapegoating, you know, you, you then, you tell a child something like that, they then grow up going, oh my God, I'm responsible for events that are happening on the other side of the world, even though literally we have nothing to do with it. You know, the starving children in China and India are not our little kids' fault. Does that make sense? <laughs> it could be some adults' faults, but it's not the little kids' fault. But then that child then grows up to feel ultra responsible, ultra guilty, ultra, uh, you know, whatever. And so we kind of walk around with this um, kind of like a oh gosh, you know, kind of attitude, even though we're not really aware of it. And what was interesting for me is that back in the day when I was doing my internship, working for a really dysfunctional company, things were going down and I was trying to fix it for the, you know, for the workers because they were really good workers. And I wasn't able to save everybody and I wasn't able to fix the crazy company because it was, you know, it got taken over by an essentially a very narcissistic person who decided that, you know, money was more important than people. Huh, what does that sound like? So, um, and I remember one of the workers looking at me and going, stop acting like it's your fault. It's not your fault. And I just was like, oh crap, I am doing that. What the bleep? You know, so we do, we have this, we, we start kind of walking around like, oh, it's, you know, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, my fault, my fault, all my fault. And we got to stop doing that because predators smell that like blood in the water. So if you'll notice, I don't do that anymore. I don't. You know, it's like if, if things are going south and I, and I can't stop it, I'll be like, gosh, I'm really sorry that that's happening. But I also recognize <laughs> this is where I begin and end. This is where they begin and end. Not apologizing because it's not my fault. So does that make sense? So, yeah, we do. We do almost have like a sign on our forehead that says I'm a scapegoat. You know, and I'm not so sure and I'm not so confident, so please scapegoat me. So we, this is why self-esteem is hugely important. And we're always learning. We're always learning. And we're always working on new areas of self-esteem. Always. It's not a fixed point in time. So as soon as you recognize there's a problem, like I did when I was like, oh, wait a minute. No, I'm not. Mm -mm, no. So you just work on it. It's self-esteem. The self-esteem workbook, Glenn Schiraldi, Disease to Please, Harriet Breaker. Work on this stuff, CPTSD from surviving to thriving. Pete Walker, put all of this stuff back onto the abusers. You don't have to be a scapegoat anymore. That is not who you are. Yes, we were used as a scapegoat by them, but guess what? Um, that's not who we are. So taking that whole costume off, thanks for plan. And like I said, once you get your self-esteem up where it needs to go and your boundaries in place and the word no is not threatening to you and you don't mind using it because you recognize that it's a it's a safety thing. No is a safety word. No is, hey, I'm safe. I'm keeping myself safe by drawing boundaries and saying no, you know. So once you recognize all that and you get certain, you know, of who you are, and even if a narcissist or an abuser comes along and goes, you, 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 you're able to look at them and go, mm-hmm, right, talk to the hand because the ears are not listening. I am not your dumping ground. Have a nice day. And by have a nice day, I mean go pound sand. So do you see where I'm going with that? So that's why self-esteem is so hugely important. Why does everybody wait until I'm doing a video and then my phone starts blowing up? Um, okay. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. How do I help my friend that is currently in an abusive relationship? This is going to be the most heartbreaking thing that you are ever going to go through. Like an addict. They are not willing or ready to look at leaving until they have reached rock bottom. And everybody's rock bottom is different. For some people, it's when they recognize the red flags and they're like, oh, okay, this is not cool. And then peace out. Other people, they stay because of the codependency, but I can fix them. I can heal them. The most heartbreaking thing is when people are like, but I love them, but I love them, but I can love them into sanity. I can love them into changing. I can, I can make them go back to the way they were. No, you can't. 
So it's it, you cannot really help them until they are ready and willing to get help, which sucks for all the family and the friends. And if you badmouth the abuser, they will do a Romeo Juliet thing and cling to that abuser like nobody's business. Does it remind them of their mom? Does it remind them of their dad? Probably. There's some sort of family of origin, original wound going on there. So really, all you can do is be there for them, bolster their self-esteem, remind them they deserve to be treated well. So when they come to you and start complaining, don't badmouth the abuser. It's going to backfire on you. What you're going to do is you're just going to be like, you know what? You really deserve to be treated well. You know, have you thought about working on your self-esteem? You know, here's here's the things I do. Here's the mirror work I do. Here's the here's the self-esteem workbook by Glenn Schiraldi. Now, if they're in an abusive relationship, the abuser will realize, obviously, that you're bolstering their self-esteem and they're going to try to isolate you from them, which is also why you don't want to badmouth the abuser because then that's what the abuser will do. They will be like, oh, well, they don't like me, so I don't want you seeing you know, your cousin, your friend, your sister, your, you know, your mother, your father, your brother, whatever, because they recognize that <laughs> I'm on to you. You know what I'm saying? So, um, um, so it's really, it's heartbreaking. There's not much you can do. All you can do is encourage them. You know, it's like, Hey, you deserve to be treated better. You know, Hey, how come we're not hanging out as much? Oh, you know, so and so is not allowing me to go hang out with my friends. They think he thinks they're a, he or she thinks they're a bad influence. Wow, do, do you think I'm a bad influence? So what you're going to do is you're going to kind of gently, gently, gently challenge that uh, cognitive dissonance because they're the abuser is telling them one thing. You are something else. And then what they'll start doing is they'll start equating you with some other abuser that they've had in their life. Well, you know, this person is just exactly like your ex-boyfriend or this person is just exactly like da 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 da. And they'll start ascribing abusive qualities or, or not qualities, but traits onto you so that the abused thinks that you're the abuser. That's the smear campaign. That's what they do. So just realize all you can do is be consistent, offer support, encourage self-esteem, non-judgment because if you judge the ex or the current abuser you know they're going to cling to them like a romeo juliet situation oh really i can't be with them watch this you know and then they'll go do that because remember this person is in the middle of an addiction this person is also in the middle of the inner child running the show and who does this abuser remind your friend of Holy crap. That's it. it encouraged them to get therapy. That's the only thing you can do. And nine times out of 10, the abuser is going to successfully excise you from their life because that's what abusers do. But if you're consistent and you're there and you're loving and kind and, you know, hey, I'm here when you need, no matter what this person says, I'm here when you need. Hopefully, cross fingers. They'll give you a call when they figure it out, or they'll give you a call when they realize that this person has been cheating and lying and gaslighting and rewriting history and all that sort of horrible stuff. So, yeah, there's not much you can do. There's not much you can do. Because if they're not willing to get help, it, it, mm. even with people who are willing to get help, I have the difficult task of breaking down the cognitive dissonance. Because you should hear the somersaults that people go into when they decide to break no contact. Well, I had to break no contact because this happened and that happened and da da da. Stop. How old are you when you stopped, when you, you, when you broke no contact? I don't know, four. And then it's like, okay. So why is the four-year-old going back to a well that's poisoned? What's happening? Do you see where I'm going? It, it, it takes a lot. Even with people who want to get out of an abusive relationship, if that inner child, if it's not handled, if it's not really dealt with, will continue to go back and go back and go back and go back, desperate to get that af affection and approval from somebody they're never going to get it from. So it's really important that, you know, when you're working with somebody who is actively leaving, that you cover self-esteem, that you cover inner child work, that you cover PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker, inner child... Uh, Inner Child Workbook by Katherine Taylor. This is why I keep harping on all of this because you've got to break down the cognitive dissonance because otherwise that inner child is going to totally sabotage. So, and it's heartbreaking because the inner child just wants to be loved, right? 
And so that's where that whole, but I love them, but I love them, but I want, you know, because everyone assumes every little kid has got that magic thinking, assuming that everybody thinks the way they do. They do not. They do not. It'd be such a nice world if everybody was nice. And then I could run an Airbnb or something somewhere. That would be my, I'd love to be retired. That would be great. If everybody got along and if everybody was nice and if everybody thought kindly and did the right thing, I seriously would be running a B&B somewhere. I really would because I'd be cooking breakfast and I love to cook, so it'd be awesome. Anyway, but it's not the way it is. People don't think the way we do. And our biggest mistake is assuming that the abuser will respond to love the way that healthy, normal people do. And they're not healthy. They're not normal. They're not. They don't feel. They absolutely do not love and they absolutely do not feel. So you've really got to work with the inner child to help that inner child understand this is not ever going to work, ever. Not on this or any other planet Earth. Not on this or any other planet in the universe, you know. So, and... To help somebody without having the knowledge of how abused brains think, there's very limited things you can do. Self-esteem, I'm always here for you. Don't badmouth the other person. Recognize that they're in an addictive situation. They're addicted to that intermittent positive rewards, you know, and that the likelihood is, is that the abuser is going to win. You know, the abuser is going to be able to successfully cut you out of their life. And if they do, okay, well, I'm here when you wake up. I'm here when you're ready. Other than that, good luck, God bless, you know, and it sucks and it hurts and it's painful and it's, it's a grieving process that you're going to have to do, but you cannot save everybody. Wouldn't it be nice if we could, but we can't and encourage counseling. You know, that's really, that's all you can do. I'm sorry. That sucks. All right. Why do toxic parents pit kids against each other? Because they love to divide and conquer. If you can have two kids fighting with each other, they don't have the time or energy to be really taking a look at the pink elephant taking a dump in the corner of the living room. Does that make sense? So, and two, for a narcissistic parent or an abusive parent, it's entertainment. It's, it's entertainment for them, and it takes the focus off of them and onto the, oh, look how bad those kids are. Look how, you know, they can't get along, and it's all them, and da, da, da. well, who the hell do you think taught them that? Mm-hmm, you know what I'm saying. So, yeah, they divide and conquer because it's a great way to control. It's a great way to take the focus off of the real villain, kind of like WandaVision. <laughs> it's like everybody's like, oh, it's Wanda, it's Wanda, and it's like, oh, shoot, it's not Wanda, what the hell? You know, and where's the real villain? Well, the real villain is the one that's, you know, Machiavellian, manipulating puppet master in the background. So healthy, normal parents want children that get along. They want a family that is cohesive, a cohesive unit that enjoys each other and has fun with each other and, you know, goes and does amazing, cool, fun things, you know. But abusive, toxic parents don't want that. Because remember, abusers can't stand the silence. They can't. Because their thoughts are nasty about themselves and about everybody else. Although they'll never acknowledge it about themselves. But they can't stand the silence. And so they have to create co constant chaos, constant drama, constant uproar, constant everything for two reasons. One, they can't stand the silence. And for two, it takes the focus off of them and it puts it onto the kids who they then scapegoat as being bad. And they enjoy it. They, they're they sadistic. They enjoy watching the nastiness. And plus the fact, if the kids were able to be cohesive and you had an abusive parent, guess what? The kids would figure things out a lot faster and they would be able to unite against the abusive parent. That's another reason why they do it. So, yeah. So I hope I hope that answered the question. Okay, kids. This is about all the time I have for questions today. Uh, this week on We Need to Talk, I am going to be discussing reframing things. So how to reframe things. So the narcissist or the abuser in our life is always so damn negative, And we end up finding ourselves saying things really negative all the time. So we're going to work on reframing, how to reframe things. So you can, again, this is more of taking your power back. Get rid of those fleas that you got from your abuser and moving forward and being positive realistically and reframing things so that you're not shooting yourself in the foot self-sabotaging. Okay, again, I want to thank my sponsor, uh, BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P. 
p.com slash Chris Godinas. I will put that all down in the description. Um, so that's it. All right. I will talk to you on Sunday. Have a great few days. Bye.